why don't we go ahead and, and get started. Um, so I'm Dan Slater. I'm the director of uh, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, or WCED. And uh, welcome everybody to what is our first Flashpoint session of the year. This is a, a new kind of round table we set up last year um, to try to capture what's going on in terms of current events in places of, of major uh, contemporary interest around the world. And so last year we did Flashpoint events on Belarus and Lebanon and on Hong Kong. So I would encourage everybody to go take a look on WCED's website and see those, uh, those prior Flashpoint series, which we try to always involve someone who's from here at WCED, as well as experts from, from outside, which we'll be doing today as well. Um, and just to foreshadow, our, uh, our next Flashpoint event will be next month, will be on November 9th, and it will be on Nicaragua, uh, alongside the elections which will be happening. Uh, not very competitive elections, but there will be elections happening in Nicaragua. Um, so we'll be meeting November 9th, and the plan at present is to meet in person. Uh, on the 10th floor of the International Institute. So hopefully we'll all be able to gather, uh, not just virtually, but in real life for that. Uh, today's flashpoint, of course, as you all know, is on Afghanistan uh, in the wake of the, the US withdrawal uh, in August and the Taliban's rapid recapturing of Kabul and the country. So uh, today's event is also co-sponsored, I should mention, by, uh, by CRIS, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies as well as by the Center for South Asian Studies here at the University of Michigan. So without further ado uh, and preliminaries, let me introduce our expert panel for today. Uh, we have Adam Casey. Uh, Adam is a WCED postdoctoral fellow uh, for 2021 to 2023. His research broadly considers the relationship between dictators and their armed forces. He has recently published two articles in the journal World Politics, including the durability of client regimes Foreign Sponsorship and Military Loyalty, 1946 to 2010. He is currently working on a book manuscript that considers the relationship between foreign support and authoritarian rule. Adam received his PhD in political science from the University of Toronto in 2020. Dipali Mukhopadhyay is an associate professor in the global policy area at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Her research focuses on the relationships between political violence, state building and governance during and after war. She is currently serving as senior expert on the Afghanistan peace process for the U.S. Institute of Peace. She's the author of Good Rebel Governance, Revolutionary Politics and Western Intervention in Syria, which is in Cambridge, forthcoming, as well as Warlords, Strongman Governors, and State Building in Afghanistan, uh, Cambridge 2014. She is also vice president of the American Institute of Afghan Studies and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, third, Jennifer Brick Murtazashvili, is an associate professor and director of the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh. She focuses her work on Central and South Asia and the former Soviet Union. She has experience advising for the US Department of Defense, the United Nations Development Program, and UNICEF. She has a forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press titled Land, the State, and War, Property Rights and Political Violence in Afghanistan. She's also the author of Informal Order and the State in Afghanistan, which was Cambridge 2016. And fourth, we have Akhil Shah, Akhil is a visiting scholar in the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He also serves as the Wick Carey Associate Professor in the Department of International and Area Studies at the University of Oklahoma. His research focuses on democratization, civil military relations, US foreign policy, and security issues with a regional focus on South Asia, especially Pakistan and Afghanistan. Akhil is the author of The Army and Democracy, Military Politics in Pakistan, Harvard 2014. So, uh, that's who we have today. So the way we'll be going about this is we'll uh, have uh, Dipali go first and then Jennifer. Uh, third, we'll have Akhil and Adam will go forth. So I won't uh, um, interrupt too much between those, but uh, Dipali, if you'd like to, to kick us off with the first presentation, that would be great. It's really great to be here and with such a tremendous set of co-panelists and looking forward to the conversation. You know, I thought I'll just start with uh, the puzzle at the heart of I think the last couple of months, which is this question of how it can be that despite all of the committed resources and time and effort and ideas, the Afghan government collapsed as quickly as it did. For me, I think that puzzle can be unraveled quite easily when we confront the fact that the fragility of the Afghan state was actually predestined in that it was a part of the post-2001 interventions DNA. So I wanna kind of focus my comments here today on an argument um, 
that state building in the service of countering terrorism in the Afghan case, which is the, the paradigmatic case since 9-11, um, this kind of fragility is, and, and ultimately collapse is a kind of inevitability. So I think it's an important time to underscore this argument because there is an insidious narrative taking hold in Washington. Um, if you listened at all to any of the hearings of Secretary Blinken or Secretary Austin on the Hill in the past couple of weeks, you know, there's a narrative that's taking hold that the United States and its allies gave the Afghan people and their leaders this incredible chance to govern themselves democratically and that they didn't take us up on the generosity um, of our offer. So now it's time to rethink these but benevolent ambitions that we have and, you know, pack up and come home and aim a little lower next time. I think it's really important to counter that narrative by making clear that the US invaded Afghanistan to its own ends, and it did so in terms that crippled any ancillary efforts at building capable democratic institutions of government. The parameters of the intervention themselves created these dependencies and imposed conditionalities and enforced restrictions that doomed the project of state building before it even began. And so for me, you know, I've been very involved in evacuation and relocation efforts and setting aside the kind of despair of that experience. From an intellectual perspective, it feels to me like the, the end of this war um, is very much a coda kind of punctuation mark that exemplifies the American project, um, you know, of state building in the service of the war on terror. That project was never at its essence about enabling an Afghan sovereign state to take hold. Instead, it was about avenging the attacks on 9-11. And in that sense, state building was a means toward an end rather than an end in and of itself and was about the creation of a regime that would be loyal to and dependent on outsiders designed in terms that would ensure rather than overcome its weakness. I think a lot of times when scholars compare different cases of state building and counterinsurgency in the modern era to those from the Cold War or the post-Cold War period, what they fail to do is acknowledge that the, the age of terror is novel with respect to both ends and means because of the perceived threat at hand. So intervening states, as they have for many decades, concern themselves with regimes and rebels, but really of paramount concern were the so-called terrorists who represented the defining actor in the site of intervention. So the outsiders who came with that agenda articulated the parameters of war making and state making, even as the ultimate responsibility to manage the terror threat was thrust upon the insiders. And in that sense, regimes birthed as a product of this meta campaign have existed in the service of a mission that at once necessitated and constricted their sovereignty. For me, the Afghan case is the pilot case for this latest version of international clientelism, which basically short circuits the extraction coercion cycle that we associate with state formation historically through the influx of this massive amount of, of foreign rent. And foreign aid, you know, and the Western support that came after 9-11 was predicated on the Karzai government and then the Ghani government's sustained provision of access to the Afghan territory for the pursuit of violent extremist actors. So, you know, a lot for me of what that campaign does is sort of underscore the variability and the fungibility of state sovereignty in the international system. Because the Karzai, Karzai regime owed its existence um, as the internationally recognized government of Afghanistan to this military campaign. And in exchange, began this new chapter of Afghan state building, but all the while, it was unable to claim any kind of control, in large parts, even influence over large swaths of the country's territory. Because these foreign militaries came with support, donor agencies, international organizations, all of these resources empowered Afghans for their country's reconstruction, but they also imposed this series of binds. 
And in post-2001 Afghanistan, that meant for the government, the Karzai government and then the, the Ghani government, that they would be perennially and deliberately unable to control many of the basic fundaments of power and politics, even as they would be blamed for governing poorly. Um, you know, there were many ways in which an already crowded warscape, uh, you know, coming out of several decades of war since the invasion of the Soviets in 1979, Western benefactors to this new government complicated that already crowded warscape in a number of meaningful ways. They collaborated with warlord commanders from the Northern Alliance in 2001, basically producing a set of competitors with whom the new government would have to contend. They excluded the decimated Taliban from politics because the Taliban was lumped together with Al Qaeda as the bad guys, even as they made an attempt to surrender to the new government. And of course, these Western countries were employing the kinetic use of force, you know, on their own terms, right up to the present day now in the, in the form we presume going forward of drone warfare. Each of those decisions then disadvantage the palace in meaningful, lasting ways. You know, and at the same time, this was the 21st century. So there was an expectation that any new government is going to govern, you know, in a good governing fashion, which means democratically, transparently, accountably. And so these kind of constraints were very tight coming from all these different directions on the regime. And um, I think that helps explain why both governments anchored their, their governing in a kind of palace politics that really privileged the preservation of their regimes and the use of whatever informal means they could to exert influence, why that privileging took place. So um, as Dan said, you know, I wrote my first book sort of thinking through the how the Karzai government transformed otherwise threatening strongmen into valuable governors. And of course, those governors didn't look like the type of good governors um, that the Western community would have preferred, but they did expand the presence of government in certain important ways. And more recently, I've stepped back and looked at the the larger subnational political map and tried to compare the approach of President Karzai to the, the next government of President Ghani. And, you know, what I basically found is that Karzai and his clique leveraged the authority to control appointments subnationally um, to remain just above the fray and to engage in a kind of political choreography, which a lot of people would not incorrectly read as corruption or nepotism or patronage politics. But for me, it looks a lot like what Joel Migdal, the sociologist, called the politics of survival. And, you know, I've been looking at the full pantheon of governors under Karzai, it was close to 200, looking at how managing of power through politics was happening in that way. So when President Karzai was succeeded by Dr. Ashraf Ghani, the second president after 2001, a lot of people thought this is going to be a very different type of rule because Ashraf Ghani was cut from a very different cloth. He has a PhD from Columbia in anthropology, was a senior official at the World Bank, wrote a book called Fixing Failed States. Um, and a lot of folks thought, well, there's going to be a different sort of philosophy of rule here. Um, but those of us who have been watching Afghan politics since 2014 recognize little of his technocratic vision in Kabul. He helmed what was called the National Unity Government, which not incidentally was brokered by the US government itself, the Secretary of State. And if you look at the so-called National Unity Government, it represented such a narrow constituency, ultimately, that when I was in Kabul this summer, just a few weeks before the government fell, people described it as the Republic of Three, which was a reference to the president and his two closest advisors. Um, the president was a member of this kind of returning diaspora elite. He had spent the formative decades of his career, but also the formative decades of the Afghan war in the West. And I would argue wasn't able to draw as effectively on the same social political networks and solidarities as his predecessor and relied increasingly on this very narrow diaspora elite. And you look at the policies 
the appointments, the war plans, and increasingly could see that they were catering to such a small regionalized base of Eastern Pashtuns that the larger vanguard of the Afghan Republic from journalists and professors to bureaucrats and soldiers felt really excluded and ultimately disinvested from the Afghan state. So for students of comparative politics, you know, looking at Karzai versus Ghani, it didn't really come as a big surprise that President Ghani fled the scene with his two closest advisors and a few others before the Taliban even took Kabul, while President Karzai is still in Kabul negotiating to figure out what comes next for him, you know, in this new chapter of Afghan state formation. I think the similarities and differences between the two presidents, actually what they really tell us is what the impulse of leaders, you know, at the helm of these regimes, that those impulses, those very personal, particular predilections end up driving the leveraging of the entire state in the service of their survival. So they use the currencies to which they have greatest access and they're not incentivized to build sustainable institutions. And you know, ultimately they're profoundly vulnerable, not only to whatever their own personal predilections were, but to the vagaries of their international patrons. And here I'll close by coming to the present moment then. You know, the American pivot to peacemaking was made with the same strategic schizophrenia that had marked much of the war fighting. The US continued to support and defend the besieged government even as it negotiated with that government's sworn enemy on that enemy's terms because the Americans had decided the war was over. Um, and even though Ambassador Khalilzan who was responsible for this effort both under Trump and Biden had a phrase that nothing will be decided until everything is decided, that evaporated and it became clear that the US decides everything you know, was really the mantra all along. So the US military began to move this summer very rapidly to the exits and the Afghan security sector was left holding the bag and largely unable to do so, not because its soldiers were unmotivated to take on the Taliban, but because again, the entire fighting machine from design to operation to maintenance was predicated on the presence of American contractors, American air power. That was the kind of um, vulnerability that was built into this model. So the Taliban's rapid victory followed, I think triggered not by some extraordinary capacity, certainly not by some groundswell of popular support, but instead because the American departure was a kind of defection that triggered a series of elite defections based on a calculation that the Ghani government could not survive the US departure. And that tragic self-fulfilling prophecy is a reflection of the notion that I began my comments with that the survival and therefore the collapse of a post-2001 Afghan government were always contingent on the decisions of outsiders, even as those outsiders claim to be building the Afghan state. So I'll leave it there for now, Dan, and look forward to the rest of the comments. That was, that was terrific, Dipali, really excellent, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, you are next and muted, unmuted, there we go share my screen. So thank you all for uh, the opportunity to, to speak with you today. And um, it's just a huge honor and pleasure to share the stage with such eminent scholars and friends um, and some new friends as well. So I, I just wanted to, to follow up. I think Dipali's talk is a really great introduction to getting into sort of how the mechanisms of the state collapsed took place. Um, and so I'm just going to, to, you know, I know many of us were really surprised when we saw the rapid fall of Kabul this summer. Um, I think I was certainly surprised by the, the pace at which the capital fell, but I was not surprised at all um, that the government fell in the way that it did. And if we look at uh, public opinion data on Afghanistan over the past, you know, this is sort of the most recent um, Asia Foundation survey of the Afghan people, you can see the national mood in the country has fallen significantly over the past several years. Um, and you can see that people who say the country is moving in the wrong direction uh, far outweighs those who think it is going in the right direction. 
um, you know, what does this tell us? Well, what was 2004? What was the pivotal moment that took place there? That was when the United States uh, really began the its withdrawal. That's when the US moved from combat operations to it's an advisory and assist uh, position inside of Afghanistan. And it also represented the time when Ashraf Ghani became president of the country. Those are two pivotal events that happened at almost exactly the same time. Now let's remember that it was John Kerry in 2014 that brokered that uh, political deal that brought Ashraf Ghani to power, sort of buffeting the point that, that Dipali has made about the important role that international, the international community had played in all of this. And so as we're looking at these, this public opinion data, trying to understand what's happened inside of the country, uh, I think many of us would be surprised to learn that the insurgency inside the country had grown quite dramatically. If we, I mean, so the public opinion data actually reflects this growing insurgency, growing dissatisfaction with the government. So by this uh, earlier this year, the, the Afghan government controlled only about 30% of its population uncontested, 30% um, of its territory, excuse me, uh, was uncontested. If you're paying attention to what's happened in northern Afghanistan, one third of the population had been forcibly displaced or migrated since 2014. That's one third of the population. It's a vast number of people that have gone through upheaval over the past several years. And so uh, Afghans began voting with their feet in large measure, leaving the country. Um, in fact, many of them began posing as Syrian refugees during the height of that conflict so they could access uh, Europe. And so very few people said, you know, we're, many people wanted to leave. And when asked what would allow you to leave, I think what would allow you to stay, what could the government do to make you stay when asked? If anything, uh, this was a question posed to Afghans who were wanted to leave, who said that they would want to leave, which was the vast majority of the population in this public opinion survey. We focus on the security dynamics, which are obviously important. But the second dynamic, which I don't think has been given enough attention, is the opportunities for improved participation. And while we, we talk about the failures to build democracy in Afghanistan, I think one thing that hasn't received enough attention is the fact that democracy was truly denied to the people of the country for many, many years. And in fact, um, if we compare Afghanistan to 1964 to the, the constitution of the monarchy, which the Taliban have now reinstituted um, and the United States instituted in 2001, there were actually far more uh, democratic elections in, in the 1960s than there were in the post-2001 period at the subnational level. Uh, there were no elections for the president that period, but during that period, there were elections for mayors, municipal councils, um, that never happened in the post-2001 period. So in the public opinion survey that was uh, conducted late last year, Afghans were asked, should the constitution, the current constitution, remain the constitution of law? And only one third said yes, unequivocally. So more than half of the population either said, no, the current constitution has to go, or the current constitution needs to, to be amended to allow for more opportunities for participation. So the rest of this talk really explains why that is the case. Why were Afghans asking for more participation? Didn't they have democracy? Well, what happened in the post-2001 period was a resurrection of old institutions. Rather than creating a new state based on a new social contract and a new vision, Afghans inherited the previous constitution, the 1964 constitution, which was simply amended and given a hyper-centralized presidency, which fused the power of a king with a prime minister together. And this president, uh, had enormous power and authority uh, to make lots of appointments, all appointments at the subnational level, 
and was deeply at odds with a self-governing society. So my first book, I look at informal institutions across Afghanistan. My current work actually focuses on path dependence and institutional legacies of these current institutions. And what I'm trying to do in this book, which is called Built to Fail, and we are, we've been talking about this sadly uh, as a book title for the past two years, and I'm working on this with uh, Mohammed Qadam Shah, who's currently a professor at Seattle Pacific University. We argue that um, the international community really uh, put all the institutions in place that were deeply authoritarian, incompatible with democracy. And this was really from the get-go. And this was a as a desire to sort of speed the Iberian state consolidation. And if you're uh, the international community, you want to build a state, what you have to do is think about how to defeat rivals. Um, I'm sorry, that was the Afghan government's perspective, was really thinking about how to defeat its own rivals. And uh, if you're uh, uh, Hamid Karzai, you're thinking about warlords, you're thinking about people contesting you for power, so you wanna move straight to Weber and this monopoly and legitimate use of force. The international community sort of sought the same thing. They wanted to speed this Weberian consolidation, but they also feared losing control and the international community had notoriously short time horizons. So doing anything new would require crafting, would result in uh, great care. And uh, as uh, the generals often say, General McMaster says that the US was fighting uh, a 20 year war one year at a time. And there's definite truth in that. So the result of this hyper-centralized system was that it created a zero sum game. And rather than reducing informal politics, which it had desired to do, it actually strengthened informal politics because Afghan society is de facto quite decentralized with uh, much power distributed to the regions among the so-called warlords, but especially among communities, self-governing communities, customary authority, and other leaders at the local level. And what this did is it de facto disenfranchised many outside the capital city who had no role in decision making at all. It concentrated all talk of politics in the capital. If you wanted to be involved in politics, you had to go to Kabul because that's where decisions were made. It also dashed the hope of constitutional democracy because when you have such a centralized system that allows for no elected bodies, no elected executive bodies at the subnational level, and I want to say that again, after post 2001 Afghanistan featured no elected officials at the subnational level who had executive authority. People could not elect their mayors, their governors, their village leaders, anything. It was they, these appointments were all made by Kabul. And so this meant that elections really didn't foster accountability, except for those officials at the national level. And even those officials, uh, there was very weak accountability for them. And that was due to electoral rules that were um, th that selected the National Assembly. And I don't want to get into that detail. We could discuss at the Q&A. But the, uh, the, the electoral system weakened constituencies and weakened accountability. Um, so this really weakened citizen state relations, citizens remained a subject to the state, it had reinforced historical processes where the center saw the regions as a source of competition, and then it really enfranchised this winner take all system that left regions out to lose. So national level politics in post-2001 Afghanistan looked so similar to its historical precedents, despite the fact that citizen expectations of what the center was to deliver changed so much after 2001. It wasn't that the people of Afghanistan didn't believe in democracy or couldn't practice democracy. They were just never really given the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way. Yes, there were elections held for the president, and yes, there were elections held for the national National Assembly. These elections were rife with corruption. And people understood the patterns of corruption um, that were really mandated by the national level that trickled down throughout the country. And where the rubber hit the road in terms of governance was at the subnational level. And this meant that although there was a new government, people really received an old constitution. There were high expectations, as I've spoken about, that after 2001 that were really dashed. The electoral fraud undermined individual trust in the state and undermined trust in the government. 
and there were really missed opportunities for elections at the provincial district and municipal level. Um, and without having direct accountability to officials at the national level, that meant all appointments to all ministries were made from Kabul. And this wasn't so much of a problem under Hamid Karzai's rule, not saying it was perfect, but as Dipali has pointed out, Hamid Karzai understood that the rules of the game came from legitimacy of communities. He was very worried about state consolidation and used the tools of the state to do it, but didn't rely on them exclusively. He relied on trust building, community building in, uh, in the state. And so he used the leverage of informal politics to bring diverse factions together under the umbrella of the state. This was done through formal means by appointing factional heads as governors, but it was also done through informal means, which was skirting the constitution in order to affect political wins. President Ghani, relied solely on the coercive power of the state. He tried to eliminate that kind of informal politics and enforce the authoritarian centralized rule of the center. He was no technocrat. He was an authoritarian leader who wielded the instruments of the state with little accountability and little desire to build accountability structures. And so although he was widely admired at Washington and the West as a technocrat, if you read his book, Fixing Failed States, he talks about himself almost in the sort of Lee Kuan Yew style authoritarian manner that the state has to consolidate its power at the center in order to rule effectively. So the consequence of this was that all of the kinds of things that make democracy work so well withered away, especially under his rule. Political parties never had a, a chance uh, of participation. The electoral system undermined their power and political parties have a very important role in a democracy. Political parties educate voters, they aggregate preferences, um, they help de develop platforms which then turn into policy. When uh, the United States and, and Hamid Karzai's government looked at political parties in the post-2001 period, they looked at them as solely through the lens of warlords and uh, strongmen. And because the electoral system froze out political parties, these factions remained frozen as they were. And there was no ability to channel political parties into a state and political parties remained as factions rather than as groups that contested for power and fought over policy issues. So despite the fact that civil society in Kabul was strengthened, overall civil society in the country in, in terms of its ability to lobby the government was weakened the longer the US was there and the more consolidated state power became. So ending with this slide is that what we see in Afghanistan is this constitutional cycle, this heavy corruption, the desire to build a state led to this vicious cycle of state collapse where you had the ability, desire to build a state, a quick dash that led to the reconstruction of old institutions. These institutions were highly dysfunctional to begin with. And one of the things we're working on right now is sort of detailing the fact that these institutions were, came from the country's Soviet past. In fact, they were hyper-Soviet. And they were, there was such dysfunction, even if the, the, the international community was able to execute perfectly its capacity building effort, the logic of these institutions, especially the regulations governing the bureaucracy made no sense. This led to vast amounts of corruption, which exacerbated conflict. The Taliban right now have instituted the 1964 constitution. They do not seem interested in embarking in any form of institutional reform. They're relying on the bureaucracy as it was, and it doesn't seem that we are going to see this vicious cycle broken anytime soon. So unless Afghanistan's uh, you know, flourishing self-governing society, flourishing civil society, which exists at the community level and the provinces, towns, and cities of the country have a role in governance, we're likely to see this vicious cycle continue. Okay. Now I have to stop this. Excellent. All right. Well, um, DePaul and Jennifer have given us remarkably thorough overviews of the, kind of the, the internal politics 
Um, and so with a little bit of, uh, I think that sets us up nicely for the final two presentations, which by Akhil and Adam, which will shift us a little bit more toward the international uh, context, as because clearly with all this domestic dysfunction, the international is going to loom very large. And I should say to the audience as well, um, that we'll be having Q&A after um, Adam's presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question to the panelists, uh, you can type it into the Q&A and I'll be, I'll be curating those. So uh, Akhil Shaw, you're next. Yes, yeah, so thanks uh, Dan uh, for inviting me to this great panel. I'm going to focus on uh, Afghanistan's neighbor from hell, uh, Pakistan. Um, I'm glad that it didn't really come up too often because I was worried I would have not much to talk about. And I think Pakistan and its policies in Afghanistan are absolutely crucial to the, this puzzle of why Afghanistan unraveled. So what are Pakistan's kind of policy goals and interests? So Pakistan has long seen Afghanistan as its traditional sphere of influence, whereby it has tried to limit uh, or exclude um, the influence of other regional powers uh, and interfered in the internal politics of Afghanistan to limit its sovereignty and independence through either destabilizing Afghan governments uh, that are not friendly or uh, and destabilizing uh, them through Islamist proxies or actually installing or helping to install those proxies in power. Why does Pakistan do this? Uh, two factors. One is the kind of the primary factor is the security competition that it has with our tribal India. So Pakistan is long, Pakistan's going to strategic military elites have long held this notion of strategic depth. And the idea is that because Pakistan is conventionally weak and territorially very narrow, that somehow having access and influence or Afghanistan would allow the Pakistani military to gain, you know, sort of a strategic retreat uh, in Afghanistan in the case of an Indian invasion. Um, so Pakistan has accused India of helping the Karzai and the um, Ghani administration of uh, but by destabil helping these governments to destabilize Pakistan by supporting different sorts of internal insurgencies such as Baloch nationalists. So this is the kind of external uh, threat factor. The other is domestic politics, and that is to suppress and uh, kind of uh, neutralize ethnic Pashtun nationalism. Now, Afghanistan has a contentious border, this historical rooted in the contentious border called the Durand Line, which is this colonial um, boundary between the two countries that divides the Pashtun homelands into two. Now, Pashtuns are the major, uh, are the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan, uh, and, a, and a significant minority, about 20% in Pakistan. No Afghan government, including the Taliban regime, has accepted the international boundary as a, as a border. And so Pakistan sees this as a sort of revisionist design on Pakistani territory, and Afghan government's providing a kind of fillip to Pashtun nationalism that you know can undermine its integrity. So how does it achieve these goals? Well, it has primarily tried to do this by supporting proxies who are Islamists but are Pashtuns. And the idea is one, to kind of neutralize Indian influence in Afghanistan, but also to kind of dampen Pashtun nationalism by putting in power groups like the Taliban or helping them gain power in order to, uh, who are Pashtuns, most Taliban are Pashtuns, but they are not driven by their kind of ethnic identities or, or ideology. Um, we all know that Pakistan has deep standing ties to the Taliban. The inter-service intelligence was instrumental to the group's creation in the 1990s. Um, and it has since been its primary external pattern, um, patron, sorry. Um, and I wanna make the point that one of the key ways in which the Pakistanis helped the Taliban survive and sustain this insurgency in Afghanistan was the provision of a safe haven. Now, this is a location where you can raise funds, recruit, and train, and communicate without the threat of any counter-terror retaliation. And I think it was crucial to the success of the, uh, the Taliban insurgency that they were able to you know, fight American, NATO, and Afghan forces, and then were able to find sanctuary in Pakistan uh, and I think I would wager to say that without the support of Pakistan, the Taliban would have had a hard time uh, um, waging a successful insurgency in Afghanistan. Their families still live in Pakistan. Their children go to school in Pakistan. The Taliban have real estate holdings in Pakistan. The Haqqani network has 
uh, uh, business interest in Pakistan. So Pakistan has leverage over the Taliban um, that it has used for its own benefit. But since the Taliban have captured Kabul, Pakistan has become the kind of de facto universe, uh, de facto ambassador of the Taliban to the world. And what Pakistan has tried to do is to convince the international community that the Taliban are moderate force, the Taliban 2.0 BS um, that they have been peddling. Pakistan's prime minister literally uh, goes around the world and, you know, in his UN General Assembly speech, he talked more about recognizing the Taliban than, than Pakistan itself. So the strategy is to convince the world that this is a reform movement to get diplomatic recognition, um, to end sanctions and to get um, aid to support the Taliban, including the unfreezing of the uh, Afghanistan's foreign exchange reserves. Um, how is it going? Not that great. So Pakistan has put all its eggs in the basket of the Taliban um, and has staked its credibility um, but the Taliban are going to be the Taliban, and the Taliban will have rules in the only way they know, which is repression. So the idea of inclusion, which is literally alien to the Taliban movement, has not gone the way Pakistan thought. The Taliban have violated human rights, including women's rights. Um, and, you know, the talk of amnesty has also been bogus. Counterterrorism, we still um, are kind of, uh, it's unclear, it's too soon to know. But the Taliban is unlikely to fulfill American demands about severing ties to Al Qaeda or allowing Afghan soil for the use of transnational terrorism. So the bad news for Pakistan is that the dependence of the Taliban on Pakistan may be diminished. The Taliban now are in power and they need to demonstrate autonomy from this external patron to its internal constituencies, and I think for, in, for internal cohesion. Um, and so it, it also had, now has access to other external allies such as Qatar uh, and is eyeing China's assistance in its reconstruction and development. Um, the other bad news for Pakistan is the resurgence of what is known as the Pakistani Taliban. Now, this is an umbrella of militant or sectarian and Islamist uh, Deobandi militant organizations that are autonomous from the Taliban, but have deep socio-political and ideological links to the Afghan Taliban. The Taliban in Pakistan have actually renewed their allegiance to the Afghan Taliban and see them as their kind of ideological um, mentors, as it were. Now, when the Taliban came into power or sort of ran, ran over Kabul, the, one of the first things they did was to release thousands of Pakistani Taliban militants, including the deputy leader of the Pakistani Taliban, who has now, uh, trying his best um, to impose Sharia in Pakistan. And Taliban have carried out over 70 terror attacks against Pakistan's security forces as well as civilians. Pakistan's hope is that, you know, their friends in, in, in Kabul will help them rein the TTP in. But the Taliban see no reason, have no incentive to do so. Um, um, the TTP or the Pakistani Taliban have fought alongside Afghanistan against American NATO forces. Um, and just for, the re for reasons of internal cohesion and sort of jihadist legitimacy, abandoning other militants like Tehrika Taliban Pakistan could undermine the Taliban's claim to kind of a jihadist uh, legitimacy and also sow dissension in its own ranks. So there's not much hope that the Pakistanis will get um, what the Taliban want. Um, and so I want to close with that and kind of this, the lesson uh, for Pakistan and other states that support proxies for their own strategic interests is basically be careful what you wish for. Thank you. Wonderful, Akhil. Thanks so much. Um, and last but not least, WCD's own Adam Casey will go forth. All right. Thank you. Um, is this, uh, somebody just tell me if you cannot see this, I guess. We, could, we can see this. Okay, great. Um, so I just want to thank WCD for inviting me to share some brief remarks today. Uh, this is a really esteemed panel with a lot of scholars who taught me a lot about Afghanistan and Pakistan, so I'm really happy to be here. So I won't claim to be much of an expert in anything, uh, but my work does look at comparative efforts by foreign powers uh, to build military institutions in client states. So I want to talk today about what we can learn by situating the American effort to build effective security forces in Afghanistan in comparative perspective. So What's pretty familiar to everyone at this point is, you know, on August 15th, after nearly 20 years and about $88 billion spent, the American-backed government in Afghanistan collapsed. 
So despite pouring massive pouring in, uh, pouring in massive resources, we failed to build an army capable of surviving even until the end of our planned withdrawal. Now, this is becoming something of a familiar story for recent American foreign policy. So in our other recent foray into army building in Iraq, uh, we built Iraqi force, you know, so the US built Iraqi forces collapse after uh, nearly collapsed in the face of a few thousand Islamic State forces in 2014, which prompted another US military intervention. So unsurprisingly, connections were made pretty immediately to the fall of Saigon in 1975. It's also led to reevaluations of America's failure to build effective security institutions um, elsewhere. So, you know, Rachel Teacott recently wrote in Foreign Affairs that all of America's efforts to build partner militaries have, quote, failed spectacularly. So while the attention to this problem is fairly new and likely, unfortunately, to be fleeting, this question has actually been asked by scholars for decades. And I'll focus a little bit just on kind of two main problems. So you know, one of the major problems with foreign military building abroad is it generates tremendous opportunities for corruption. Um, in Afghanistan, ghost soldiers, which is soldiers that exist on paper, but in fact, the pay and uh, the various materials allotted to them uh, are pocketed by commanders, were thanks to Saigar in Afghanistan, an extremely well-known problem for many years. And another issue that I think a few of my panelists have touched on is that with the foreign intervener directing their own troops to fighting insurgents, client governments in fact, almost feel relatively safe to focus their energies on political survival, in most cases, you know, shuffling around their military command and filling it with cronies and allies rather than investing in military capacity. So there are certainly plenty of examples of failed army building by the United States abroad. Um, so Cambodia is a very sadly forgotten foray into army building by the United States. We paid the entire defense budget of the Cambodian armed forces and spent ultimately some $9 billion on the war. Uh, we did our own audit in 1972. We found only six to 8% of salaries were actually going to individual soldiers. Here we have a nice quote from Henry Kissinger learning about this fact. So when the US backed dictator, Lon Nol was confronted with this, he responded, quote, calm down. The Americans are killing a thousand of our enemies every week. Victory is ours. Victory was not ours, and our efforts in Cambodia failed. So in April 1975, the Khmer Rouge marched into Phnom Penh as we frantically evacuated our personnel. And so what was the US retrospective on this failure? What lessons did we learn? Well, first, Henry Kissinger again here suggests maybe we just didn't drop enough bombs on Cambodia. And in fact, this is a critique that's recycled uh, prom frequently today. Um, here we have the man who just will not go away, Scott Walker, suggesting that maybe we should just bomb Afghanistan again. But did we really not bomb or you know, spend enough military resources on Cambodia? We dropped more bombs on Cambodia than all of World War II combined, which maybe killed as many as 500,000 civilians. Very little evidence we did not put enough in to Cambodia, and that is why we lost. So we are far from the only country to have attempted to build militaries abroad. This is a very non-exhaustive list. The Soviet Union built militaries from scratch in many places, Bulgaria, Eastern Germany, Hungary, Mongolia, North Korea, Poland, Romania. Vietnam built an army completely from scratch in 1979 in Cambodia, and they drastic, dra dramatically transformed the army in Laos that rules to this day. So there's a lot of other efforts. So what do we learn from these other efforts to build militaries abroad? So first, it's a lot easier to transform an existing army than it is to build one from scratch, which is what we tried to do in Afghanistan eventually, not necessarily right away. And the second is that the Soviets did a better job than we did building politically loyal armies, but not necessarily better at creating armies that are good at fighting wars. So we'll talk about that now. So were the Soviets better than us at building militaries abroad? So it really depends on what you mean. Soviet Union was really effective at building armies loyal to pro-Soviet political regimes. So some of my other research demonstrates Soviets have pretty effectively exported their own party army model, which was really effective in preventing military coups. Soviet clients on average lasted substantially longer than the American, French, or UK-backed regimes. But the evidence is much more mixed for military effectiveness. So part of this is challenging because it's really hard to know if an army is effective, if it's not fighting a war. Is the North Korean army currently effective? Were the East European armies effective? These are actually really hard. That's a really hard thing to say. US intelligence, for example, did not think the Eastern European armies were ever very effective. So we can learn some stuff from Soviet supported armies that did fight wars. So the Soviets poured billions in Ethiopia, about as much as we put into Cambodia. Thousands of advisors, Cuban combat troops, a top Soviet general helped direct operations against insurgents. 
Yet again, yet this army collapsed in 1991 to insurgents with less than a third of the manpower of the Ethiopian army. So the Soviets promoted their own system of what was called triangular command in Ethiopia. This is where each unit is led not only by a military officer, but also a secret police official and a commissar, which proved disastrous for military effectiveness. Officers were highly constrained, terrified of making tactical mistakes for which they'd be executed, and so the force was highly inflexible. What about the Soviet experience in Afghanistan? So the Soviets had a really different task than we did in Afghanistan. They attempted to aid an incumbent regime versus build an army from scratch. Um, they thought their intervention in December 1979 would last a month. They ultimately were very wrong about that assumption. The Soviets really struggled to rein in and modify the behavior of their Afghan clients. So um, Nur Muhammad Taraki told the head of KGB foreign intelligence when he visited about a month after the coup that, quote, what the Soviet Union did in 60 years, we'll do in five. Khrushchev was also told if you come back in a year, you'll see that the mosques will all be empty. This was, of course, not true. Um, a massive insurgency ended up embroiling and ultimately eventually overthrowing the Afghan government back with the Soviet unions. So the Soviet Union, like us, also struggled with bureaucratic rivalries. Soviet intelligence agencies often backed different factions within the Afghan government and struggled to coordinate their behavior. The Soviets, like us, really struggled to build effective logistics systems that would function on their own, prevent desertions. Preventing desertions was a huge problem for the Soviets, and building an effective, complicated units, especially like air forces, were, were really difficult for Moscow. They really struggled to Afghanize the war, and ultimately, they built a very repressive Afghan state that achieved reasonably strong party control over its own uh, uh, state personnel that was able to effectively put down several coup plots. Now, the Soviet, in fairness to Moscow and Najibullah, the communist regime outlasted everyone's expectations. Here we have an estimate from 19, September 1988 of the CIA suggesting that the Soviet-backed regime would probably last six months. Many people will remember that was also the estimate we gave to the um, regime in Kabul, but in this case, um, the client lasted about uh, four more years. So ultimately, however, in Afghanistan, the army there did collapse too. Parting thoughts. The US is far from alone in trying, to, trying and struggling to build effective militaries abroad. Uh, many of our successes, like the Republic of Korea and Japan, still have US troops there. One issue is preference misalignments between patrons and clients. Clients want political survival and patrons want effective armies, which are actually often in direct tension with one another. Militaries are usually built in patrons' own image, which can often be really inappropriate for local conditions. The Soviets were just as bad about doing this as we were. Um, foreign states also struggled with bureaucratic rivalries. It's important to remember that foreign aid is actually done by individuals, and those individuals have their own sets of biases and, and uh, bureaucratic rivalries with one another. The Soviets built you know, politically loyal militaries, but it's really hard to say if they were more effective. And then what about Europeans? So colonial built armies were actually rarely tested by highly threatening insurgencies or interstate war, and they've rarely been effective when they have been. So no one is very good at this. Thanks. Okay. Terrific presentations all around. Well, you know, it, it strikes me just to kind of get the ball rolling here. And as we wait for, for questions to come in, so the Q&A is, is, is open. So if anyone wants to type in questions, you know, it strikes me that what, what, what Adam is suggesting about military seems like a more general problem of politics, which seems to be kind of throughout all these presentations here, which is that, you know, the, the imperatives of incumbency you know, that what it takes for people to hold on to power just so often seems to be in, you know, direct you know, contradiction to what it takes to actually govern effectively, you know, and whether we're looking at the case of, of, of Pakistan and these questions of, you know, what's good for, you know, what's good for Islamabad, as opposed to what's actually good for governance in, um, in Afghanistan. And we think about you know, Jennifer's presentation on, you know, foreign aid. And again, this, this question of, you know, at the end of the day, governing effectiveness seems to be in almost nobody's immediate interest. And I just wonder if this, if we should sort of think of this as a more general syndrome that we see in, in Afghanistan, where there are actors who were interested in governing effectiveness, who simply weren't able to get the resources they need or get the authority they need, you know, is there, is that part of the story as well? Um, so really, if, if anybody wants to, to kind of speak to this sort of question on the, on the panel, there's so much knowledge about the, about the case here. I'm sure we could, we could learn a lot more. So, you know, Jennifer, Dipali, Akhil, anyone want to take that on? I think so. You know, we talk about creating the Afghan state in the U.S.'s image. 
maybe in the army this was true, uh, but I remember speaking to a group of very senior military officers, must have been uh, 10 years ago. And I, I, I said that uh, state society relations in Afghanistan actually re resemble to me uh, the American example quite a lot is that people want a state that's strong enough to do things a very wine gastian way, right? People want a state that's strong enough to provide some public goods and services, uh, but they want to be able to come to that state when they want it, when they need it. And we have this idea that Afghanistan is ungovernable or that people didn't want a central state, um, but in fact, they wanted a state that they could trust, that they could approach, and that they could have some selection in how they dealt with. Um, instead, what the Afghans were given was actually a Soviet state, um, which was very authoritarian. Um, so while the, and I think this is one of the really important choices that the U.S. made is that um, the, the U.S. may not have been very effective in building the, the, the Afghan National Army, but until this past year, I would argue that the Afghan National Army was one of Afghanistan's biggest success stories because it was seen as a widely legitimate organization. It had high levels of public trust. People sent their sons and, and even daughters to go work for it. It was seen as actually one of the few unifying factors. And this was because um, the U.S. made the choice along with its Afghan partners, but this wasn't until 2004 to completely uh, scrap the way the army was organized, get rid of the old conscription model. So at first there was this like piecemeal effort to build the Afghan national army. Um, and the US wasn't really taking the lead. There were all these different countries that had a role in the army. And then there was a decision that the US would take over. Yes, the US created this army in its, in its own vision, but it made a huge departure getting away from that party soldier model that actually re was retained in the Ministry of Interior that was responsible for for the police. And so if you look at variation between the army and the police, there was huge reform of the army. Now, in terms of battlefield tactics and strategies, I think that's a whole nother question about you know, whether American strategies and tactics were adapted. Um, but it, to me, it's very interesting that that's one area where there was actually substantial reform. Um, there was much more bottom-up processes in terms of, at least under, under Karzai, Ghani changed that quite a lot. He re-centralized many aspects of the army. Um, he put military commanders under his control. And this was even uh, you know, prior to this past year, where now it's really been revealed how much control he asserted over the army. Karzai was had a, a much more hands-off uh, allowed sort of the civil service and the Americans to play a much larger role in that. So I think these are really interesting questions and, and I don't think there's any easy answers to any of this. Maybe I can just jump in, Dan, and say that, you know, I think the other piece of, of what, sorry, the other side of the coin of what Jennifer is describing is also, I think the kind of hypocrisy of, of outsiders who claimed that governing effectiveness was in fact their goal, when in reality, the ways in which they engaged with politics, with coercion, with capital, you know, whether it was through aid, whether it was through militias, um, whether it was through, you know, talking a big game on anti-corruption while at the same time having clients who were doing counter-terror work on behalf of the US government, these, these kinds of hypocrisies in a lot of ways, I think, made it impossible for any sort of governing imperative to really take hold. And I think in the past in Afghanistan, we've seen, um, and this is often, I think, a point that's missed, various forms of government, you know, and various forms of governance that interact in different ways and balance formal and informal institutions are more or less decentralized. Um, but I think that's it's an it's just important for us as outsiders and for donors and for intervening actors to really reflect on was it really a government that you know was it really state building that was actually the project here or was it about instrumentalizing politics and power in the service of outside interests yeah that's really well put and i just think i think really you're your opening comments kind of, you know, to me, situated the whole conversation insofar as you know, it, 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 it's not much of a puzzle 
if no effective governance is built when no one with any power is actually invested in building effective governance, right? So as Jennifer was saying, it's not that there's a lack of demand. It's not that people don't want good, <laughs> good government or there's no political will. It's just that those people don't have the authority to actually you know, make the hard decisions and to, to allocate resources in such a way to, to get buy-in from you know, people with any actual authority to do these things. And so you really kind of wind up with this empty shell in so many different ways. I mean, certainly Akhil's story with Pakistan, this is a neighbor from hell is not a neighbor who is, you know, at all interested in or, or trying to, you know, foster the rise of, you know, good governance and effective institutions as well. So it's kind of hard to know if a place is ungovernable or not, if nobody, if no one is actually interested in governing or making the, the, the sacrifices necessary, putting the resources in, um, you know, to do so, right? But something I think is important to remember is that Afghanistan was governed during this period. It just wasn't governed by the state. And I just really want to, like, when we talk about Afghanistan as this ungovernable place or it's an ungoverned space, there's plenty of governance in Afghanistan, plenty. It's very rich in this regard. It's just the state is not the source of that wealth. Terrific. Okay. Okay, we're getting a couple of questions just starting to filter in. Others are certainly welcome to, to do so as well. So Ernie King from the audience is asking kind of the most, most difficult, in, intractable question in a way, um, but not an unfair one, which is to ask about, you know, in hindsight, you know, that was the, does this all mean that the invasion was a mistake? Was there better reactions that could have been, um, that, that the United States could have um, led with after the attacks of 9-11, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. Um, I guess one just sort of speaks to the question of is, you know, how, how, how doomed these things are from the outset, how much this is about the way things were implemented versus something that there was never any, any prospect of success, which of course speaks to Adam's, you know, question here, like, are these things ever, you know, are there ever successful versions of these? You know, is this something where we should just immediately think, external intervention in these sorts is always something that's going to be doomed to, to fail or are there ways to do so in ways that are less destructive that are maybe are more effective for building governance, whether through the state or to Jennifer's point through through civil society. These are big, these are big hard to answer questions, obviously. But. I mean, if everyone's feeling shy, I can jump. I can jump in. I mean, this is really the million dollar question, the counterfactual that I really struggle with as a person who first got interested in Afghanistan in the summer of 2001 and made my first trip there in 2004. And, you know, it's interesting to look at Jennifer had the Asia Foundation polling to think about the different moments where I was there over the last 17 years, kind of and feeling the that sense of possibility and then the sense of despair and kind of that roller coaster. You know, I think that there are a couple of strategic decisions that were made early on that had they not been made, I think would have would have made a big difference. The first of which is I think the notion that decades of war would be brought to an end without any kind of a peace process was an absurd basis upon which to begin the project of, of building a new state. And as I said in my comments, you know, this idea that you would soundly defeat the previous regime and then when the leaders of that regime come forward in order to surrender and to be accommodated as has consistently happened in Afghan politics over the years and in many other places of, across the world, for them to be marginalized um, your basic, you know, it's like debathification in Iraq. You're essentially laying the groundwork then for an insurgency. I think the second piece of that is that we know from the social science literature that insurgencies thrive with safe haven. And this comes to Akhil's presentation that to think that you could engage with Pakistan as a partner with such a long leash with no real sense of accountability in any way, shape or form as an insurgency then is able to read, the Taliban is able to reconstitute itself and literally kill American soldiers, not to mention all of the Afghans that were killed. The illogic of that policy um, 
for me is really a tough one to get my head around. I guess, unfortunately, what I would say is even those, those two facts seem to me really obvious as alternate approaches that could have been taken. I have very little confidence from what I've seen of the US government's approach to foreign policy in general. And here maybe to Adam's point about how these things are difficult for a variety of reasons. I'm not confident that, that either of those decisions would have been made had it been a different president. I mean, we have many different administrations, many different political parties and persuasions who, who made these mistakes. Um, and that that is a very unfortunate, I think, because they don't see, it doesn't actually seem impossible to, for this to have gone differently in that sense. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think the, there's the, you can ask this question both ways. There's the question of Afghanistan's governability. And there's also the question of, you know, America's capacity for governance, you know, whether at home or abroad. And when you see the, you know, the, the, the kind of the mistakes and the, you know, the lack of, the lack of effective steps taken by multiple administrations, it suggests it's something pretty hardwired into American approaches to, to governance itself, you know, you know, perhaps. Um, it's certainly not a, you know, a very, a very soothing thought. Um, but I think something that, that, this certainly invites us to, to, to be to be thinking about as well. well I Jennifer? think once those issues of resources, um, you know, at that post 2001 period, we look at this counterfactual, like what could have been done differently? Um, you know, should the US have not invaded? Well, I mean, the US invaded and, you know, many of those uh, decision points that Depali's talked about, about, you know, the peace process or negotiating with the Taliban or welcoming them, the vast resources that began pouring in and were promised to the government um, led, it was a kind of insulation and led them, I think many in, in, in the Afghan leadership to believe this was sort of insulation against um, this, this Taliban and that it would just sort of wither away and that they had you know, the presence of the U.S. military. And, you know, there was no talk about a quick withdrawal at that point. It was uncertain about what would happen. And very quickly, um, the talk turned to nation building or state building. And it, it, it didn't really ramp up into this full-blown thing that we saw until several years later. But the resources certainly crowded out many of those, I think, more constructive the conversations, which I think lead us to have to have many very honest conversations, not just about military assistance, but also about civilian assistance. Okay, great. Okay, we've had a couple more questions. Oh, Akil? Yeah, please. Was that a, and you're, you're muted, you wanted to? Well, the Doha peace process or so-called peace process, really a death sentence for however ineffective and you know corrupt the Afghan government was, that was the kind of sense of abandonment. And then forcing the Afghan regime to release 5,000 Taliban fighters and pretending that they would go and I don't know, open a restaurant or a shop, 90 or 80 to 90% of these guys went back to fight. And I think it was General Milley or Austin testifying before uh, the Senate, I believe was said, well, when we let them go, I think the uh, Taliban got stronger. Well, duh. I mean, what did you expect? So Doha was really, you know, kind of sidelining the Afghan government and uh, just talking directly to the Taliban and, you know, giving them the legitimacy, which allowed them then to use Doha to, you know, kind of gain broader international legitimacy and travel to China and, you know, kind of find more backers for, for the eventual, for their eventual return to power. I'll just say one final little thing. Um, so I think it's worth remembering the proposed budget for the Afghan army in 2002 was $1 million that we wanted to fund. We initially were very uninterested in building a strong Afghan army. We, we later came to spend an astronomical sum. The counterfactual obviously is had you invested much, you know, many more resources right mm -hmm. away, could you have built something slightly more effective? Had you built through the Northern Alliance rather than trying to to, to build something new. I mean, I think like these are reasonable questions to ask. Um, so I think that's like something worth keeping in mind that yeah, maybe we could have done something, you know, different or had, you know, the other classic is not shifted our attention immediately to Iraq. So, um, but I think lots of missed opportunities early on, whether those would have ultimately changed the course is really difficult to say. Just to briefly pick up on your point, I remember distinctly around 2003 and four, when I was traveling in the kind of northwestern border areas of Pakistan, 
And I could see signs of the Afghan Taliban kind of making a comeback and the Haqqani network had begun to kind of um, replenish their ranks. Um, and I asked an American diplomat, I said, do you guys care? Like, you know, what's happening? And he's like, that's not really my brief. Um, and everything you're saying, you're right. The intelligence sources, they were all moved to Iraq. And I don't know what was going on in Afghanistan and that, you know, that kind of distraction or whatever. And as Dipali pointed out, you're pouring billions of dollars into a country that is then giving that money to the insurgents or using that money to support insurgents who are in turn killing your own soldiers. It's really mind boggling the way the uh, the US has dealt with Pakistan. Um, a classic answer is, well, what do you expect us to do? It's a nuclear armed state, right? Uh, we needed their ground lines of communication to supply our troops. We needed the airspace for drone strikes. All that, if all of that is true, and you know, kind of, if, if you look at it pragmatically. But at the end of the day, you're enabling and empowering within Pakistan uh, the military, which is completely unaccountable, which has, you know. Um, been supporting the Taliban at the same time as it's repressing civil society in Pakistan. And you're kind of enabling and empowering them by giving them more resources, but also by not saying, you know, by not even reprimanding them, right? So looking the other way, well, Pakistan is doing whatever it can to undermine your interests in Afghanistan, um, but you're still giving them money. It's really a perverse, you know, you created that perverse incentive for Pakistan. I think it also comes back just to the question of political will in the United States as well. You know, when you know when Adam mentions how little, you know, in resources were, was being spent to try to stabilize Afghanistan after the invasion in the first place, and um, this is going to lead me to Pauline Jones's question here. But I think that the, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, America is supposedly we're a democracy, and w the things that that we do are things that are supposed to have the active support of the American population. And it does seem like there was a real lack of of effort to try to convinced, you know, persuade the American people that this was something that they should be investing in. And this is something that um, the American people, you know, had any kind of say in, I mean, kind of fell off the radar screen. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, you know, so Pauline Jones asked about, you know, whether the withdrawal itself could have been done differently and would withdrawal at any other point in time have led to a better outcome. But I just kind of want to situate that in the broader context of, withdrawal seems like it had to be inevitable in the sense that there just wasn't, you know, domestic political support for it, right? And for the, the kind of costs and the kind of resources that were being. So given, if, I mean, if, if my point is, is, is well taken, if it's correct, that essentially withdrawal was made inevitable by American domestic politics, if nothing else, then within that, within that universe, how do we think about the politics of the withdrawal itself? Um, what could have been done differently and whether this was essentially, um, you know, something that couldn't, that could not have been done in a more stabilizing manner, perhaps. Anybody like to step in? On I mean, that? I can jump in on this because I've been in, you know, in DC thinking about this a lot. Um, I, I actually don't think that, I don't think Americans were particularly concerned about the presence of 5,000 and then 2,500 US troops on the ground. I don't remember this animating any domestic political conversation until President Biden put it center stage. And one of the things that has been very striking to me is how upset Americans have actually been by, which wasn't something I was expecting. My assumption was, to your point, Dan, there isn't will, political will for these kind of efforts. Um, people want forever wars to come to an end and they, they end, however they end, everyone will be glad that they've ended that way. I'm really amazed through the kind of evacuation related work I've been doing, just the incredible groundswell of concern on the part of the Americans about the way the war ended. And this comes to Pauline's question, which is, you know, my colleague here at Minnesota, Helen Kinsella and I wrote an essay in May, uh, right after Biden made the announcement about the withdrawal to say, it's possible to have a just exit. Like it's possible to think about what a responsible withdrawal looks like. And here to Akhil's point, I think the, the whole premise of the Doha process, if, had it been genuine, was to link the withdrawal, which was the number one wish for the Taliban, was to get rid of these last American troops, to link that withdrawal to a peace process. Mm -hmm. 
And the notion that nothing will be decided until everything was decided was basically to say, we will lend the leverage that we have from our last 2,500 troops who are not in harm's way, let's be mm -hmm. clear. I mean, there are psychological and social effects, of course, of being at war, but they were in largely in a training support capacity. We will lend that leverage to the Afghan government so that they can negotiate from a position of slightly greater strength vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban, which has been legitimized through its engagement with the US. I feel quite strongly and was part of the Afghan study group effort. And you know, there were many conversations going about uh, on about this for quite some time in the lead up to the withdrawal. That had that phrase, nothing is decided until everything is decided, had we given that even a shot, at a minimum that the, the Afghan government would have been, been in a slightly better position to negotiate some kind of a, an outcome in which some of the, all that has happened in the last 20 years and as Jen said, the history you know, of governance in Afghanistan and politics and constitutionalism and other things could have been in some way preserved rather than wiping the slate clean. Now, maybe that wasn't possible, but I certainly think if withdrawal was inevitable, then at a minimum, if you don't care about what happens inside Afghanistan, at least you could have planned for an inevitable refugee crisis. You could have had a plan for how you're gonna manage the regional dynamics. None of that appears to have been on the table. And to me, it's not, I, I don't think it's reasonable to say that that was inevitable. While I agree with many of the points that Tapali has made, I think we also have to look at the, the political dynamics you know, in the United States. Uh, we had political leaders who had made this promise to withdraw. And you know, even though the public wasn't thinking about it, politicians, politicians are. Um, and it was clear from Biden's statements as a candidate, as a vice president, that once he came to power, he was going to withdraw. I was really shocked to see so much discussion in Washington about uh, the U.S. staying or leaving a residual force. It was pretty clear, you know, from the outside looking in that the U.S. wasn't going to stay and it was clear that this was a continuation of Trump's policy, and it was actually a continuation of Obama's policy. You know, recall that in 2009, President Obama began the withdrawal process from Afghanistan. He announced a military surge, and he announced the withdrawal. And at that point, I think that the intervention was irretrievably broken. That's when the money really began flowing to Dubai, when people stopped investing in the country that the U.S. was seen as a short, you know, had short time horizons. Um, so, and, and I think the other thing is we can't idealize who the players were in all of this. Um, there was such a lack of trust between Kabul and um, the United States, between the Ghani government. The Ghani government, I think, as Dapali has pointed out, was widely, it was illegitimate in the eyes of so many people. This triumvirate of three, it was completely isolated, was unwilling to cave or compromise with anyone. So, you know, my, my feelings on the withdrawal was that it had to happen because the longer the US was there, the worse the outcomes were on average overall for the people of Afghanistan. And I'm talking about the violence, the destruction. Yes, Kabul was in a, Kabul was suffering as well. Yes, you know, there's these trade-offs, right? They're, they're difficult trade-offs, they're impossible trade-offs. Um, but so much of the population you know, for example, I, I just talked about the North. We haven't even talked about the East and the South and what was going on. The government, and, and one of the things we also haven't discussed is the potential counterfactual that, you know, the U.S. had been talking about withdrawal for so long, had, had uh, really drawn in so many of its troops. The, it was clear that the Taliban, regardless of what Biden said in April or not, was planning a major offensive this summer. Was the United States prepared to launch this major attack, increase the number of troops, uh, do everything that was required as the Taliban took over cities in Afghanistan over this past summer? I think that that would have happened. We took, you know, there's so much focus on this, these technical issues of logistics and air support. Now, I don't believe it for a second because these logistical issues were, 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 were leading back Back on these sort of technical questions that make us all feel better, like we could have done something because we're not actually addressing 
the legitimacy issue. And the legitimacy issue, people were not going to fight for this government any longer for the reasons that the Pali pointed out. And people were tired. And if the, ta the Taliban did a, a brilliant thing by promising surrender, if you hand over your weapons, if you go back, you know, we're not going to touch you, go back to your village. That was the new strategy. And they deployed it brilliantly and led to like the very quick collapse of the government. Yes, it was accompanied by Biden's announcement, but that was a long time coming. Right. So we have about five minutes left. And so what I wanted to do is focus on one last question and let everyone give everyone a minute or so to, to, to respond to it. So uh, Natalia Forat, who is a who is a fellow at WCED, asks about the future of the Taliban regime. And since the Taliban does not seem to be into power sharing, it seems like it'll have a lot of the same flaws as the Ghani regime, not incorporating local communities, not allowing participation. So to each of you, so what kind of vulnerabilities would you expect this regime to have down the road? And anyone um, could could jump in first. Akhil, do you want to go first? And unmute. Yeah. You know, there's this notion that there was this other Afghanistan outside of Kabul, uh, which uh, you know kind of heaved a sigh of relief from all the this you know the never-ending war and the repressive Afghan security forces. And so that may be true, but that's only if the Taliban can deliver. If the Taliban, um, they don't have any, you know, obviously they're illegitimate, but they need to have some performance legitimacy. That is complicated by the fact that, you know, Afghanistan is facing what the UN has called a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, and when you face legitimacy problems and it, when there is some resistance, the Taliban are going to use repression. The more repression they use, the less legitimate they would appear to the international community, um, and the less likely that they'd be recognized and they'd get the kind of humanitarian aid and other aid that they need to govern. And so, in my, I think the the death knell would be the lack of legitimacy uh, and the way they govern. the The idea that they would share power is, you know, they're they're saying we won. Why would we share power with the losers? Uh, and even within the Taliban, the so-called moderate Mullah Barader, who was kind of the head of the political office and involved in negotiations, has been sidelined by the Haqqani network. And the Haqqani network's really, you know, kind of a bad, these are bad guys. So Rajadeen Haqqani is now in charge of the interior ministry. He's, you know, a globally designated terrorist and he's in charge of policing. Um, and so... I don't know how, how they're going to, the international recognition that, that they desire is unlikely to be, you know, uh, unlikely to come unless they can show that they can govern, but they only know how to govern in a repressive and kind of exclusive way. So there's going to be trouble. I don't know when or how long it'll last or whether it'll happen, but that's my um, guess, reasonable Great. guess. Adam, I'm going to you next, and then maybe to Jennifer and to Polly in that order. Is that okay, Adam? Yeah, I'll just say briefly, um, and actually Dan and I recently wrote some of this up in the Washington Post, but I think the rapidity of the Taliban advance, I think, has led some to, has obscured a little bit that they have some kind of serious internal weaknesses. Um, so one of the most pressing internal weaknesses they have that's common to a lot of rebel groups is they have an exiled political leadership that's coming home with kind of relatively weak ties to the insurgent commanders that now make up, you know, what is becoming the new Afghan state army. And in particular, they have a real problem where they have this Haqqani network that Akhil just mentioned, which is actually quite autonomous and um, has been put in charge of the interior ministry and the uh, Mullah Omar's son has been put in charge of defense. And so you're looking at pretty soon a pretty serious kind of looming potential um, uh, splits within the Taliban regime that I think it's really unlikely to have to suspect there's going to be any kind of major unifying uh, force within them now that they've overthrown the government. So I think they have a lot of internal weaknesses um, that are unlikely to be solved in the in the medium term. So thanks, Jennifer, and then to Polly. Their reliance on coercion uh, to maintain their rule is going to undermine everything that they're trying to do. And the worse the economic outcomes are for the country, the more that they're gonna to have to rely on this. Uh, that sort of seems inevitable because of the issues. You know, people are talking about the, the women teachers uh, and, and, and the, the Taliban right now, they're playing this game. I think it's, it's strategic with the international community bargaining rights for aid. Uh, it seems that this is really what's going on here. Uh, so 
it, it seems that that uh, access to aid will be granted. The, the Taliban have this incentive right now to sort of pull back on all these things and and say unconditionally, you know, the, the teachers, we're only banning women temporarily. It's until conditions get better. And so this is allows them to hedge, negotiate with the international community to get the kind of aid that they want in the hopes that um, this aid will alleviate the economic situation. And by doing so, the Taliban make the same strategic error about performance legitimacy that the United States and others have. Yes, the economic situation is dire. They, 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 they now talk about, you know, Rome, what, there was a quote like, Rome wasn't built in a day. I read that one of the Taliban leaders said this, right? Um, that Rome wasn't built in a day. And so they have to rebuild the country, re-educate re everybody. Um, but this goes back to the notion that it's stuff that buys you legitimacy and that does not buy you love. And I think that should be one of the big lessons for us, not just in Afghanistan as beyond. We have this notion that performance legitimacy is about providing things to people, giving people things. We tried that a lot in Afghanistan and people can see right through it. When people feel that they are trusted, when people feel that their leaders treat them like human beings, um, that there is not this deep alienation and we don't have to have democracy to do that. But democracy is not the only source of legitimation that can produce that kind of outcome. Um, but it was deeply felt inside of Afghanistan and, and the Taliban. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's easy to poo poo the Taliban's legitimacy and just call them agents of Pakistan. And as we hear so much in the media and of course, but we have to understand that they have been ruling so much of the countryside for, for a very long time. And yes, they have been using coercion to do it, but so has the state and so has the international community. Uh, so, you know, to, to discount the source of legitimacy, I think that they have in certain parts of the country, I think is um, really runs the risk of making the same mistake again, but they run the risk of making the same mistake that everybody else is doing by becoming a rentier economy. Paula, you want to get the final word? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, I, I agree with all of this. And I mean, I'll just add that I think it's, they had this sort of elegant, albeit draconian ideology that served them really well, I think, as an insurgency, even as rebel governors in the territories they controlled. Very small set of concepts, not much in the way of a expansive bureaucracy to kind of make that manifest. But that's very different than governing an entire country. You know, the kind of urbanization we've seen, the age, average age of an Afghan is 19. The sort of narrow totalitarian project, I think it doesn't really, I don't think it will have the same legs across the country, particularly in urban areas. And I also think, you know, the, the challenges internally that Adam described are important, but so too are the international challenges for the Taliban. Their international community um, is a tricky one for them. And if they actually can cater to the jihadists that they have been in bed with for all this time, they may find the West, you know, back on their doorstep again. Um, and so I think it's a very difficult project that they have ahead of them. Uh, but I think we're going to be studying them as an insurgent, as a remarkable insurgent success for a really long time as well. Okay. Well, thanks again to everyone for this great conversation. Just to remind everybody that the next uh, the next Flashpoint series we'll be having, um, hopefully in person, COVID willing, on November 9th uh, on the case of Nicaragua on the 10th floor of the International Institute. Uh, but most importantly for today, just want to thank everyone for being involved. Thanks so much to Derek Groom for, for setting up and running this with such aplomb as always, went beautifully, I thought. Um, and to Adam, to Akil, to Dipali, to Jennifer, thank you so much for uh, joining us and speaking to this, this case, which a couple months ago seemed like it was the only case people would care about, and now it's fallen off the radar screen again. Um, so hopefully, you know, the, with the kind of attention you guys are paying to the case, uh, you know, make sure... People are informed and aware of, of all that's going on in Afghanistan as we speak. So uh, best wishes, everybody. Thanks again for joining us and looking forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.